In the 1920s and the 1930s, the United States of America enforced prohibition upon the states. Al Capone had created an organization where he would bruise on alcohol, making millions, and obtained an army of men by the time he was imprisoned. But who were the men who put the notorious crime boss away for good? The Untouchables. The one group Al Capone couldn't bribe and couldn't touch. They raged a war against organized crime. They threatened them and bribed them. But they ended up landing Al Capone in jail. The Prohibition Act, a ban on alcohol or any recreational narcotic in the hopes that the people will be sober and find work during the Great Depression. The government rummaged the cities of all alcohol. The people of the United States were not happy with this new law and they went against it and went to the contraband alcohol parlors called a speakeasy. The speakeasy was the place to be at the time. They were a breeding ground for new industries that may have been against the law, but they were the most profitable companies at the time because the content was in short supply and was very rare among the United States. Most of the speakeasies had a password, and they were not inviting to everyone. You had to know a person to get in. They had no defense against federal agents, but they had one trick they used. They were all in secret places, where they were not easy to find, and if they were supplied by a big crime boss like Al Capone, then they also had gunmen to try and keep the place well defended. Elliot Ness, a law enforcement officer in Chicago. He received an assignment to serve with a special unit to bring down the notorious mobster, Al Capone. He created the Untouchables, an organization built to stop and put down Capone for good. By October 1929, Ness had selected nine agents to carry out the task. Capone was making alcohol illegally, but they couldn't put him in jail because there was no evidence supporting their cause. An article which I believe appeared in a newspaper asked why, since you are, or it would seem that you are in effect the mayor of Chicago, you have not simply been appointed to that position. <laughs> Al Capone, the one man nobody would cross, he was expelled from school at age 14, joined a gang, and earned his nickname Scarface after being cut across the cheek during a fight. He was ruthless and intimidating, but kind and helpful to the people that followed him. He was involved in the Valentine's Day Massacre, the killing of seven of George Bugs Moran's men in a garage. Moran was one of Capone's longtime enemies. The seven were gunned down facing the wall. Seventy rounds of ammunition were fired. After the police had come, they had discovered the body of Frank Gusenberg, barely alive. They pressed him to reveal what had happened, but he wouldn't talk. Everyone blamed Capone for the murders, but he said he was in Florida when the killings had occurred, and nobody was sent to trial for the killings. Capone ruled Chicago with violence and an iron fist. The notorious mobster needed to be stopped, and the country had no way of doing so. No man would take the risk going against Capone, and everyone that did was bribed or killed. Someone needed to take him down. The assignment was to destroy the breweries that belonged to Capone, and find evidence that could expose Capone and his followers breaking federal laws. Ness's goal was to destroy the gangster's approximate annual salary of $75 million. The special unit began locating and shutting down breweries in the Chicago area affiliated with Capone. Through surveillance, anonymous tips, and wiretapping, they were able to discover the businesses in which Capone was involved. Within the first six months of operation, the Untouchables had taken 19 distilleries and six major breweries, costing Capone $1 million. Excuse me, Mr. Ness. Mr. Ness. I'm Ness. I wonder if we could talk for a minute. John O'Shea, Alderman, 43rd Ward. Yes, Alderman. I know who you are. Would you excuse us? We came up to congratulate you on a job well done. Share your good fortune on such a... One of Capone's men paid the Untouchables a visit. He offered to pay the unit $2,000 to stop ruining Capone's businesses and promised an additional $2,000 each week following if they continued to cooperate. Lovely Outraged, day. Ness ordered the man out and called the press into his office. Ness announced that neither he nor any of his men could be bought by Capone. The Untouchables hit Capone hard, forcing the media against him and raiding his alcohol breweries. Each time they would raid a brewery, Elliot would call upon the media, making Capone's reputation disfigured. They stopped believing his lies. Being the biggest suspect to the Valentine's Day Massacre, it was only a matter of time before he was thrown away for good. Capone, however, fought back and enhanced security measures around his breweries, 
making it difficult for Nessa's men to raid them. Capone assigned men to find the agents and the untouchables and follow them. Ness even caught sight of one of Capone's men watching his parents' home. For some time, the squad was unsuccessful in their mission. One raid, however, did prove successful, forcing Capone to lose $200,000 on one brewery, the biggest financial loss thus far. Capone's anger increased, and he sent someone to successfully murder a friend of Ness. Al Capone. We have no Mr. Capone. We have no Mr. Capone. I said... Something you want here? My friend was killed today. I don't care. You don't care. Hey, now he does. Come out here, Capone. You want to fight? You want to fight you and me right here? That's it. Come on. Somebody, you afraid to come out from behind your men? You afraid to stand up for yourself? You want to do it now? No. You want to yeah. go mad now? No. Come on. What? Easy. You talk to me like that in front of my son? I don't even... It's me. It's me. It's me. Not this way. You got nothing. You got a lot of talk and a bad. You're here because you got nothing. You got nothing in court. You don't got the bookkeeper. You got nothing. Nothing. And if you were a man, you would have done it now. You don't got a thing. In response, Ness made a phone call to Capone, telling him to look out his window at 11 o'clock. At that time, Ness paraded all of Capone's vehicles seized from the raids to be auctioned off. Following this, three murder attempts were made on Ness, but Ness and his men didn't give up, and they discovered a large brewery, and the unit halted the operation in the brewery, costing Capone an estimated $1 million. What? They got the shipment. What? They got the whole shipment. I want him dead. I want him dead. I don't care. What am I alone in this world? Did I ask no, you what you're trying to no, do? No, Did I ask no, you what no, you're no, trying no, to do? Please. I want you to get this where he breathes. I want you to find this Nancy boy, Elliot Ness. I want him dead. I want his family dead. I want his house burnt to the ground. I want to go to the middle of the night. The Untouchables forced Capone's business to try and smuggle in alcohol from outside of Chicago, a more expensive and time consuming process. In that time, the Untouchables had finally become successful and snuffing out Capone's bootlegging business, allowing the special unit to assemble a legal case against Capone and his followers. On June 12, 1931, Ness went before a federal grand jury and accumulated indictments against Capone and 68 members of his mob for conspiracy to breach the Prohibition Act, specifying 5,000 different offenses against Prohibition laws. In the end, however, Capone was never brought to trial on any Prohibition charges. Treasury agents began to gather evidence to file Capone for income tax evasion. The U.S. District Attorney decided to put the mobster on trial for the Treasury's charges, saving Ness's prohibition violations in case Capone escaped conviction. Capone's trial began on October 6, 1931, with Ness present in the courtroom each day. Within two weeks, Capone was found guilty, sending him to jail for 11 years in prison. He was first sentenced to the U.S. State Penitentiary of Atlanta. After that, he was moved to Alcatraz. Alcatraz had extreme security measures that kept him from smuggling money onto the island. After his release, he moved to his Palm Island estate, where he died of cardiac arrest at age 48. After the Untouchables had dissolved, Ness was chosen as the chief investigator of the Chicago Prohibition Barrier until the Prohibition ended. After that, he was moved to Cincinnati's Justice Department where he was responsible for locating and destroying moonshine operations. After several months, Ness landed a new job as the investigator in charge of the Treasury Department's Alcohol Tax Unit in Northern Ohio. In 1957, Elliot and Oscar Fraley published The Untouchables, which became one of the century's most famous crime-fighting stories. Elliot Ness and his incorruptible men in the Prohibition Barrow fighting Chicago gangster Al Capone proved to be a bestseller. The untouchable story of the few men brave enough to stand up to Capone will go down as the greatest stands against organized crime in U.S. history. <laughs>